Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another edition of What's on My Desk. I decided to have Roman join me here and to discuss a little bit about 39 versus 41 millimeter Royal Oaks. And if you could do me a favor and take off the watch that you're wearing, it all started with the reference number 5402 ST, which is the watch you're looking at here. Oddly enough, to the naked eye, you guys are gonna say, well, wait a minute, it looks like every other Royal Oak from the modern times, but yeah, that thing is 50 years old. Uh, and again, it started in 39 millimeters. 39 millimeters is what started it all. One of the, I wouldn't call it flaws, but one of the issues that, with the design of the Royal Oak is the lug system, right? If I take a modern Royal Oak versus even its original counterpart, you sort of have this 39 millimeter case, but the minute you go from here to here, that expands tremendously because of that additional case material that's basically lets the bracelet sort of uh, you know continue on. But considering the times and the times this was designed, that's really not a flaw. It's more of something new and something that wasn't taken into consideration because at the time, that 39 millimeter Royal Oak was, rather a big case size. was huge. Yep, it was huge. It wasn't you know, and not only was it huge, it was also overly expensive. Right, because at the time people were saying a stainless steel watch for how much? Are you nuts? Is that gold? Right. Mm -hmm. But we're not. This episode is not about history. It's strictly about you know what we get hit on Instagram for all the time, and that is the difference between the 39 millimeter case and again the 41 millimeter case. The pros, the cons, the wrist size, the comfort level, etc. Because of that very lug system that I just mentioned, the minute you start to expand the size, you're expanding the distance between the end of the case where the lug system sits. I was also gonna start by saying it's very, very hard to, to where to start. We noted to start in 1972 with the 5402 and where the brand is today. And one of the things that makes Royal Oak so iconic is the same thing that makes a Daytona iconic, which is the same thing that makes a, 19, a 911 Porsche so iconic, right? Well, you it's, call this the greatest blank canvas ever made. I 100% I agree. And as we've seen, they have made so many different variations of the Royal Oak, from th starting with, th in, uh, with a 39 millimeter, going to 41 and everything in between. They would scale down to 37, they scale down to 36, they went to 38, and they did a lot of things in 33s. between, right? Then they started making offshores up upwards of 48 millimeters, right? So again, it is, in our opinion, the best blank canvas on the market. Um, I'm gonna jump to from the 5402s to the 41s and i'm going to skip everything in between and there's a reason i'm going to do it so why do you think that they took such a perfect model a 39 and went into a 41 i have my line of thinking right it's never really been explained but i have an idea as to why that i mean happened. i can tell you i can tell you my opinion on that remember the market has flip-flops from Royal Oaks to Royal Oak Offshores. Ever since mm -hmm. the 20th anniversary of the Royal Oak, when they came out with the offshore in a 44 millimeter behemoth, te theoretically it's listed at 43 millimeters. However, it, I think they measured the bezel and that little tiny bit of space that's outside of the bezel makes it a 44 millimeter, commonly referred to as a 44 millimeter actually. But the original offshore came out in a 43 millimeter case, right? Where at the time the biggest Royal Oak was 39 millimeters. Mm -hmm. and not counting turbions, which were uh, 45, but they were still identified as a Royal Oak, right? The Royal Oak turbions, which were in a 45 millimeter, but that was a different ball game. Theoretically, the concept is also Royal Oak, right? So, but just regular Royal Oak production, they were doing this at the time where bigger was better. And the offshores took off like a craze. It was the offshores that kicked off the big craze alongside with guys like Panerai with their 44 millimeters, along guys like Hublot Hello. with their 44, 48 millimeter stuff, right? And the big craze took off. And really, the Royal Oak was pretty steady up until 1992. It was doing well, it was doing its thing, it wasn't anything outrageous in the market. They were part of the Holy Trinity, they had a certain following. It was a time where, prior to 1992, it was a time where the dress watch ruled the world, right? Mm -hmm. But these Royal Oaks, they kind of kept chugging along and then they blew up the industry with the offshore. Bigger is better, which actually put the Royal Oaks even further down on the totem pole. Absolutely. And it wasn't until as of recently, I would say five, six years maybe, that the Royal Oak, it flip-flopped, the Royal Oak took over their popularity. It was actually post-08, when a lot of the popular offshore models crashed. You had you know, Grand Prix trading at 125,000 and they 
came back down to like 70,000. Yeah. So that leaves a bad taste in people's mouth, but they still want to buy. So who, where do they go to? Okay, Royal Oak is the next big thing. Yeah, I remember when I first started in this business, heavy, let's say 2011, 2012, that was the craze of the bigger watches. And when I got into the business, the 41 Royal Oaks were kind of coming into fruition. And that's what we were trading. That's what people wanted first and foremost. The 39s definitely took a back seat. So did a lot of the Nautilus, right? Because a lot of times we compare Royal Oak to Nautilus also came out around the same time Gento created the Royal Oak. And Nautilus is really weren't a thing when I, when I first started. You know, thinner case profile, thinner case You couldn't give away overall. a 5711. Yeah, you couldn't I remember give away. selling a 3710 for So 10 41 grand. millimeter Royal Oaks at that time, they created them, was all the crazy. And they made them stainless steel, they made them ro rose gold, they started making perpetual calendars, they started putting other complications in there, and then they blew up. And then there came a point when the 39 came back with the 15202, I would say, which if you remember at the time was also not really trading at a premium. We were buying them at discounts, selling them at discounts. And then somewhere, somehow, they exploded. The 39s came back and they came back heavy. But I will, I will tell you this, it was the 41 millimeter that put the 39s back on the map because people realized, once they realized, as the value started going up on the 41s. And I think the really, really the one watch that put the 41, uh, millimeter Royal Oaks on a map, you know what it is to me? It's the rose gold black dial on a bracelet. That was the watch that actually took them to the next level. It was a good looking watch. It was still big inside. It wasn't too big. It wasn't too heavy like the bricks. The it's also a beautiful watch. And it's a gorgeous watch. Beautiful to me, watch. that's the gold medal in terms of Royal Oaks. Right, absolutely. There's, there's, nothing, there's nothing else out there. That OG rose gold Royal Oak on a bracelet. I have, I have a theory about how how and why 39s, you know, there, there's, always, there's always a catalyst for, for, for things to, to start in motion, right? It's just the law of physics. <laughs> 15202s, I remember when they made them, they were actually described as boutique onlys, right? So at the time when they came out with a 39 millimeter 15202 or brought it back, there was a huge selection of 41s on the market. Mm -hmm. You had steel time onlys, you had steel perpetuals, you had rose gold time onlys, rose gold perpetuals, chronos, turbs, and everything in between. Whereas in the 39 case form, you had one watch for a long, long time. So, I've been talking about the 15300s. Let's see. Is there a 15300? I can't see yeah, anything. Right here. So we have a couple of 15300s here, which I talked about. These guys being the biggest sleeper for the longest. Biggest time. sleeper, yeah. For the longest. You want to put this back on? For the longest time. And to me, uh, you know, they were the least popular. A white doll 15300, you couldn't Nobody give away. Nobody wanted them. I Nobody wanted back them. Back in the day, 15300. You know, and then again, as the craze goes on and as people start seeing dollar signs, that's what it comes down to. It comes down to dollar signs. I remember having a 39 millimeter Royal Oak Perpetual with uh, the blue stone dial, the. A lapis? With lapis. I sold it for $18,000. It's it's a, yeah, it's a $200,000 watch today. Mm -hmm. And the minute that people see dollar sign, what's the first thing they do? Stuff that I've been telling you guys for a long time, they start going backwards. And what do they go backwards to? Let's look at, I think, probably, I'm gonna go out on a limb, the best looking lineup of 39 millimeters is in their skeleton lineup. Like the, like the skeleton yellow gold, like this, these are the kind of things people started going back to, and you started seeing auction results of people saying, oh my God, there's only, there were only a handful, I think there was only 14 of these ever made. Uh, the, the piece that we the had, tantalum. the tantalum, the, the, the piece the that we had, yep. you know, that's $700,000 in auction. Even simple things such as, not too big of a variation, but a simple stainless steel with just a platinum bezel and sort of the subcircles around the, the subdials. All these things started going through the roof because people started realizing, you go back to the times when these were made, this wasn't the hottest thing on the market. This was something that was short produced based on demand. And demand at the time wasn't as high as it is today, nowhere near, probably one fiftieth of the demand. And people start, and this is what brought the 39 millimeters back even stronger, some of the high end pieces. In fact, we saw times where, I remember times where if I took a regular 39 millimeter perpetual, whether it be in steel or yellow gold, in this steel or yellow gold, I remember the times where I couldn't give those away. I remember the times where yellow gold perpetual you could pick up under $30,000. And again, one thing, it's funny, I was just talking to a client uh, about Daniel Roth, right? How Daniel Roth sort of jumped off. And I told you guys about this quite some time ago. And I said, in the watch industry, there's no, there's no this. It's this and then this. You right. see a spike it's, in, it's you, instant. You see a spike in demand for products such as that, and then it becomes damn near impossible to get them on, on the market. If today I needed to put out a call for any one of these pieces that we have here, you can't 39 perpetuals, you can't get it. You can't get them. You can get 41s, even though 41s still bring more money, 
But you can't get the 39. I want to cold. talk about a, a, a funny 41, right? So as of late, last few years, you saw a huge demand in gem set pieces. Your Rainbow Daytonas is what started it all, not a Royal Oak. Your uh, Saru's, uh, anything Rolex that's gem set and Paddock that's gem set and the Nautilus lineup especially, something that's set off emotion. Well, I'm gonna show you this Rainbow Royal Oak in white gold. This Rainbow Royal Oak in white gold is an interesting story. If you're a friend of ours, you know who I'm talking about in Dubai, I actually managed to order 10 and 10. He ordered 10 rows and he ordered- I remember. And yeah. he ordered 10 white. In his words, he said, this is just a try. You know, just to see what happens. Little did he know that it was going to take off. And then they made a few more. Mm -hmm. uh, they made, I think they made it yellow, rose, and white now. Uh, with the Pave dial, I am only aware of rose and white gold. I and don't I think, recall yellow gold. Again, irrelevant, yeah. right? So, so this was a watch that was a complete trial. Again, at the timing is everything in this industry. Mm -hmm. And at the time, the rose gold, oh, the rainbow Daytona, well, there was no rose gold Daytona at the time. It was only white and the yellow that they came out with first. At the time, that was a watch that was trading at double list. At the time, the list was like 80 some thousand, and I think mm -hmm. it was trading around 120 to 150,000. It was sub 200,000. It was sub 200, yeah. it was sub 150, really. And he had the wonderful idea of getting something like this done and just to see how it does. And I remember picking these things up less than 100,000 when they first got mm -hmm. it the, from the first batch of 10 and 10. And then through the roof and they went all the way up to what? It's uh, 300, 350. Mm -hmm. If you see now they stabilize around what? 250? 250 to 300. 250 to 250, 250 to 300 metal. depending yep. on condition and metal, right? So again, it's, it's also really about the timing. And so Royal Oak quickly made its way into the rainbow world and subsequently followed the rainbow frosteds and all the other stuff that they did with the rainbow stones. And, and it did really, really well. Royal Oak Turbion, a, 40, a 41 Royal Oak Turbion in rose gold for a while was that gold medal. But then what they did, they started making too many variations. And that sort of kind of like took a dip in the middle somewhere and then until they started coming out with newer stuff such as this. Which is actually one of my quarrels about 41, the whole 41 millimeter lineup as a whole. And we've covered this in many details, but I'll you know, remind the viewers again that the reason that the Nautilus, in my opinion, will still reign supreme over the Royal Oak is because in the Nautilus catalog, there is a handful of watches still to this day that they've actually made for many years and haven't discontinued. Yeah, they just continued 5711 Blues, Whites, and a few other key models. But yet they have you know under 15 of them in the catalog, whereas, Roy whereas Audemars Piquet is Royal Oak based. So that's my one quarrel with the 41 is that they made too they, many variants. Let me rebuttal that for you. Again, I just mentioned two minutes ago, it's all about the timing, right? So at uh, one time, Francois, who in my mind is the most genius CEO of any watch company ever. I agree. In my opinion, what he's done for the brand, right? At uh, one time, Francois decides, you know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna start cutting down production. I'm gonna start cutting down doors, i.e. authorized dealers, and I'm gonna start going the boutique route. Everybody laughed at me, myself and every other gray market dealer included, saying, Psh, I can call 50 different people and get Audemars Piguet at this much off. Mm -hmm. What are you doing? Who's gonna buy this stuff at the boutiques? And he knew this wasn't going to be an overnight success. But in a matter of a very short time, relatively speaking, on watch market, I'm talking about maybe two to three years, yeah, very short he, time. Managed, he managed to do what? Managed to get the product off the market from authorized dealers, even the gray market, because it was no longer that available to you, and he put it all into boutiques. And then later on, he came up with the wait list, he came up with the application stuff, and all, mm -hmm. that, other, all that other bullshit that you have to go through in order to get a Royal Oak. Purchase history and so on and so forth. Which now makes it damn near impossible and then, to get in the stores. The time that you started seeing so many variations of the 41 millimeter or like this Turbion I just showed, like the, the variety of these perpetuals and steel, titanium, gold, et cetera, that, that's sitting here, right? That's when, you know what he was doing? He was cashing in on the home run of an idea that he came up with. Then later, everybody in the industry followed suit. It was him that invented that. It was him invented that shortage. It was him invented that wait list. It was him invented that purchase history. And then ADs, they got to keep their dealerships follow suit along all the brands. And then all the brands follow suit, so, which is why when people would laugh at him, I said, you know, I first laughed at him and then I thought about it. I said, watch, this is gonna happen. Of course, I was biased at the time because AP happens to be my favorite brand. I was a fan of the man and I'm definitely a fan of the Royal Oak. But this is why the pet peeve that you have is that it came out during the time where it was, he was done, he was finished, his thing worked, whatever he came up with worked, it was a big gamble, 
and now it's time to cash in, and that's what he was doing. That's why they made so many. Yeah, correct. But I'm saying if you look at the catalog overall broadly today, just go on the AP's website. Go on Luxury Bazaar's website. You'll see such a crazy variety of 41s in their catalog right now. And even still, in the 39 case form, you're going to see 16 202s. You're going to see an RD3 and maybe a handful of other pieces. There's some 38s in there. There's some 37s thrown in there. But the bulk majority is 41s. Chronos, Chronos on straps, steals, steals in leads me to leads me to my question: yeah. thirty nine or forty one? So maybe forty one is so, the sweet spot. So this, I would say universally the sweet spot for wearability is thirty nine because a thirty nine oak is very reminiscent of a Daytona in terms of size. If it's a thirty nine in an oak, it's about a forty in a Daytona, right? So for me, somebody that does not have a big wrist, without a doubt. Unanimously, I'll go 39 millimeter. Now, my problem is that my favorite Royal Oak of all time is the Ceramic Perpetual <laughs> in every color. White, black, blue, hopefully they make some other colors. So that is my favorite Royal Oak, and if there's only one Royal Oak I could have, it would be that one, although if you take Which the Which one specifically? Which ceramic would you take to include the skeleton? Uh, yeah, I'd go with the black ceramic skeleton. Double balance or Perpetual? No, Perpetual, Perpetual. I mean, my favorite, my favorite Royal Oak uh, of all time is a 39 millimeter, and that is, and yeah, it goes back to my old days where they actually made, uh, remember the tantalum that we had, they made 19 of? Mm -hmm. They also made a tantalum skeleton perpetual, a rose gold tantalum. Color of tantalum against rose gold, it was a beautiful combination. You'd be hard pressed to find one on the market anywhere. Whether they made it in skeleton and non-skeleton. At one time, I had a skeleton version with a matching chain, tantalum and rose gold. I remember that. Yeah. And I sold it for like twenty some thousand dollars, twenty four thousand dollars for the set. Yep. It was that. it was absolutely insane. But that would probably be my favorite. And if you want to talk about uh, some older stuff, one of the things that I want to mention is stuff that people have slept on in the past. Is this? what they like to call an ugly tourbillon because it's crownless, as they say, right? Uh, because the winding crown is the back. This was made for the 25th anniversary of the Royal Oak. They made 25 of them. They did this in steel, they did it in platinum, they did it in rose gold, they did it in a skeleton and a non-skeleton version. Again, as you said, variety is king uh, with, with AP, but certainly that's another watch that's a conversation piece and that's another watch that's sort of a long hold. Modern line, 41s yeah. today. What are some of the long holds, in your opinion? Because it's very easy to say, hey, hold all the skeletons, hold things like yeah, this. Yeah, I would, I would say. You know, uh, sell your regular perpetual editions. I would say, generally speaking, of course, it's, it's uh, double balances. I mean, I think, I think Francois, at the time, when there was, there, was a, there was a rumor, I remember the specific rumor they were talking about making a 41 and a double balance and a skeleton, right? So I was referring back to the 15... Uh, 305s, but they used to have at the time in stainless steel and rose gold, which was one of my favorite watches. The 39. In fact, in fact, probably, probably my favorite AP uh, m minus the ceramic perpetual would have to be the 40th anniversary platinum, right? Um, 15204 PT, I believe it is. But um, I would say holds in terms of today would be some of your limited edition dials, like the Premier dial that they only made 10 of. Um, obviously, the Qatar edition with the with baguette bezel. So, AP has a very, very unique way of you know putting out a catalog of a lot of stuff and then and then leaving a few unicorns out there to be to be admired. Um, I will Listen, say the ceramic perpetual. Yeah. At its hype, at its peak, was how much? Ceramic perpetual. Non skeleton. Peak, non skeleton. Uh, I'd say three fifty is a, is a Where good. Where is it at right now? Sub two twenty five. Sub two. What's the MSRP? Today, because it, it changed. At the time, it was ninety nine seven. Let's call it so, so let's call yeah. it a hundred thousand. Let's call it a hundred thousand dollars. The proof is in the pudding. Oh, 100 percent. The market fluctuated, right? But yet the watch is still trading on MSRP. Every ceramic is out there over MSRP. Every double balance out there is over MSRP, be it gold or oh, steel. Oh, speaking of double balance, so let me or let, let me go back to my story. So when when there were talks about Francois making his double balance, when that dropped, it was like an atomic bomb that dropped on the market. Everything else took a backseat. It was kind of like when 50 Cent came into the hip hop game, right? He came in like a hurricane, everybody just took a seat back and just had to let that pass through. When the Skeleton 41 Double Balance came out, it just cracked and it cracked everything. Nobody wanted anything besides that watch. And for whatever reason, the 39 didn't do the trick. When the 41 came out, it I took think the reason the 39 didn't do the trick is if you remember, the first 39 millimeter skeleton that came out was the rose gold on a strap. On a strap. And Royal Oaks on the straps were always taking a back seat, very comparable to a Daytona on a strap. Mm -hmm. uh, but 
Then uh, I remember at the time the offshores were ruling the world, the limited offshores. I remember they came out with a Royal Oak Sachin Tendul Core, you know, the Michael Jordan of cricket, right? And people didn't take very well to them for one simple reason, that it was on a strap. Prior to CM, they did on a strap. Didn't take off. The minute you take a Royal Oak and you put it on a bracelet going back to its original DNA, mm -hmm. that's when you start seeing movement on the market. Of course, today those watches are up and through the roof. Speaking of Royal Oaks on a strap, what I'm wearing is uh, pro sales. probably also, you know, to go outside of the perpetual, is probably one of my favorite Royal Oaks. But two, there's two reasons for it. And number one, it's, it's a very sentimental watch to me, right? That was actually the only Royal Oak that was doing well during the era of limited offshore, the only limited Royal Oak. Again, there were many limited edition Royal Oaks out there. Very not interesting. In, in comparison to it. But the, reason, but the reason that one was doing well is one, there weren't too many limiteds. And people were like saying, okay, well, this is cheaper at the time. And I feel like it's the second best thing because maybe I'm priced out of the market with a Montoya that's trading at 35,000 today, right? The Royal Oak Chrono Alinghi, right? and they made it in steel, they made it in rose, and they made it in platinum. It was 1,500 and 100 pieces, I believe, or 50 pieces in platinum, I don't remember. That was the very first watch I've ever sold on eBay. If you guys have the kind of time to go to our eBay store on the Luxury Bazaar and scroll back to page 5,646 <laughs> and look at our very first feedback fall watch that was sold, it was a stainless steel Royal Oak City of Sales for $9,750, and it proved my stubbornness at the time where I told my wife about this whole business idea and I said this is never going to work and my wife said no I think it should because my whole thing is who the hell is going to buy $10,000 watches online and lo and behold the first watch I sold not quite 10,000 but just under 10,000 was that very watch not this very watch but it was this very model so this this is a bit of a sentimental value but if you want to talk about comfort level if you want to talk about comfort level to me, there's nothing more comfortable than a 39 millimeter Royal Oak on a rubber strap, i.e. the city of sale. 6702. <laughs> it's not a Royal Oak. <laughs> Easy, there's nothing more comfortable. Richard Sorry, Milbert. Let's, so, talk, let's talk about 41 millimeter chronos, right? Like this, yeah. the, like this white one here. So they come out of the gate, they do a black, they do a white, and they do a blue. Mm -hmm. Naturally, it was already around the time where blue meant boutique only edition. And the funny mm -hmm. thing is, is that dealers were out there our community is like a, it's like a, a herd, right? Like one, one, de one, one, de one dealer will say something and everybody just follows suit, right? Mm -hmm. Like at the time, I could have said, oh, uh, you know, there's a green dial coming, which may have never been true. These, you, you know yeah. what I mean? And at the time that the blue came out, I think it was the secondary market that pushed them to be boutique only. I'll be honest with you, because I knew for a fact that when everybody was saying blue is boutique only, they were available at ADs. But I think. Over time, the company caught on and said, you know what, everybody's talking about them being boutique only. Let's just put them in the boutiques. It became the norm. It yeah. became the norm. Yeah. But the plain dials, when they first came out, you know, the white, the black, the blue, I was actually a fan of the black because it popped yeah. more. Because the blue, the first blue Royal Oaks, they were, they were a bit subtle. Here's a 15300 if you compare it to a 15500. We have yeah. a 15300, 154, and a 15500. So it's actually. Let's put this in. You, you guys can kind of see the difference in the blues. 15,300, 15,400, 15,500, okay. you can sort of see the evolution of the blue. And the same thing happened in the Royal Oaks. Now, we don't have a current blue Royal Oak. The Chrono, you mean? The Chrono here. Chrono, no. Chrono, so, but here's a perpetual. But here's, a, per here's a perpetual that's sort but it's of. it's going to be the 15,400 color perpetual. Yeah. So, so if you look at the difference between the blues, you, got to, you sort of get an idea. Because as the blue became that color, that boutique-only color, that exclusive thing, mm -hmm. they made it more and more prominent. And uh, again- and they did that with the 15202 ST, if you remember. They, they did. Because it came out in 2012, and then a few years after, there was, you know, for lack of a There was the re-edition. Yeah, re-edition Mark II die or whatever. So there is actually a quite noticeable change in them. There is, there is. So blue is certainly was the way to go. Of course, then we got on the green kick. Do we have any greens here? Uh, green we shipped out today, and, and I would say the Royal O Green is uh, something that they definitely need to work on because it's almost impossible to differentiate from blue or black. It's, it's such a subtle green. You know, if they made it a little bit more royal. Like the very a, first green that they came out with. Very first green. The Royal Oak in... Uh was it yellow or rose with a green dial? What was the first one? It was the. It was the You're talking about the uh, hourglass edition. Yes, the very first yeah, one. Yeah. That was a nice, That's prominent a green. green. Well, I mean, you could also say uh, when they came out with the sunburst green, fifteen two hundred two. Now the sixteen two hundred two. That's different. You had you know it's gradient black, and then it goes into like a really very very rich green. But the two six two four O's or the Royal Oak anniversary fifteen anniversary greens is very underwhelming. It's just barely green, you know. Uh, and I the, love my greens. What I wish they did is uh, back 
before the offshores, you know, they made Royal Oaks with colorful dials. When they used things like uh, lapis dials, when they did things like red dials, but all of those were done in much smaller cases. Your 36 millimeters, your 33 millimeters, you can still go out there and find them. Mm -hmm. With the offshore line, they went the color route. Okay, this, these were the original OPs. They always didn't come up with that first. They did the yellow offshore, the purple offshore, the teal offshore, the, the, the bright blue offshore, they did the red offshore, they did the brown offshores. They had that uh, you know, variety of color when it came to offshore. They never really did that with a Royal Oak. Maybe that's in the works, AP, if you're listening. Because I think if tomorrow they come out with a line of 15, 5, what are they now, 15, 5? 15, 5, 10. 15, 5, 10. Which we have right here. And they, so this is the new one. This is, 15, imagine 15, if they yeah. took this and watch and they just gave it a red. I mean, I would just, go the same I mean, colors. I, did, I would go point, the same colors as the offshores on these. I mean, I just, and I would give it a bracelet and a strap to match. At this point, they've they've done that so many. They, they've changed they've changed the dial in so many. I mean, different look at what they did areas. with the gem sets. Uh, the two yeah, sets yeah. that they made well, with ten that, million dollars. That's gem set. No, would, remember, remember we did the video about the new yeah, AP yeah, releases, yeah. and we, me and you were guessing the retails, and was like, oh, I don't know, it should be about maybe four, five hundred thousand dollars, ten million dollars for the set. That's crazy. That's a well, again that 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 set will never be less than ten million because now there's two of them exactly. It's one of those pieces of art. Now, I want to kind of wrap this up by asking you, because I have my opinion, pros and cons of 39s versus 41s. I think the easiest uh, way to answer, and again, remember, both me and you are very biased. We have the same size, small, mm -hmm. I have a 6.75 inch wrist. Mm -hmm. I think an average wrist size is probably about in the sevens, right? Maybe seven, seven and a quarter, right? And a large wrist is seven and a half and bigger. So, or maybe eight. So for a guy like myself and yourself, at 39, the pro of the 39 is that you're gonna find comfort number one. Yes. And number two, if you're out there looking for rarity, if you're out there looking for something that is difficult to get, you won't see another person in the room wearing it, and it's not just another Royal Oak that everybody's flexing, you're gonna go with 39. When it comes to 41, the- Variety. Variety number one is the, is the, is the, is the pro, as well as newer use of materials, your ceramics, right? Your newer style skeletons, right? Because you look at the skeletons on the 39s, it's, I mean, it's a very refined, very reminiscent of Breguet, the finishing, everything else. You look at some of the newer style skeletons, it's different. A 41 double balance skeleton is not as refined as that of a, say, 39 millimeter perpetual over there, but again, variety. It's more intricate, there's more. It's just newer. Yeah. yeah. It's just I will, say, I will say one of the things that they did better over time, and they did very little things better over time from 39 to a 41, but what they do, did do better for sure is, especially on their perpetual calendars, the visibility of the perpetual calendar. True. On 39s, very, very small right. I mean, very, very I small mean, it's, it, if you And look, then once you get into the skeleton forms, I mean, it's very, it's, very it's, hard it become, to read. It becomes somewhat... Although un beautiful, although 39 millimeter skeleton perpetuals aesthetically is... You'd be hard pressed to find a better looking watch, but the readability is very tough. But nowadays, it's because if you feel like it still becomes irrelevant because most people will do it on their phone. So look, based on everything that we said, you know, if the question is 39 or 41, I think all rows will lead to 41 for reasons we already told you why. Uh, but the 39s are just in line. It was the 41s that brought the 39s up to where they are today right. and opened people's eyes at options out there. I will still wear a 41 millimeter Royal Oak. I won't be as comfortable. It still looks decent on the wrist. The only thing that happens when, when I when you wear when you wear uh, I don't know if you can zoom in on this. If you when I'm wearing this 39 on a rubber strap, you'll notice that the watch hugs my wrist perfectly. There's really no holes in between, right? The minute I take a 41, what you're starting to see a size of where a hey, this watch may be a little bit big for you. It's big, it's big it's, on my it's wrist. It's when you start seeing these holes here, right? You sort you sort of see where the bracelet no longer hugs you. I don't know if there will ever be a world where they will curve the case to make well, it more I will, ergonomic. I, I will say this, one thing that we're missing here that we don't have currently here is when they started making the 41 ultra thin turbs. Okay? Yes. So you have a bigger case, which is not very comfortable for me, but the thinner case profile makes it actually wearable. So I personally don't really like wearing 41 millimeter Royal Oaks unless the ceramic comes in, because ceramic is light, it's stealthy, it's mean, and I just love love the way the watch looks, so I always wear it. But if you give me, you know, just a traditional or basic 39, well, I don't want to say basic, but I'm saying just one a of the middle, yeah, A39 or a 41, I would prefer to wear a 39, although the overall mass catalog of 41s they just, there's too dynamic. I won't be surprised that they will go back to a 39. Well, I mean, listen. Bring back like, some like, of these classics in a, in a more modern way. 
And I think at the end of the day, we know one thing and one thing that stands true. As you've always said, the Audemars Piguet Royal Oak is the ultimate blank canvas and they can't fucking go wrong. If they make, AP if you're listening, because I think you've listened to me before, I've said a few things and you made it happen, a 39 ceramic in any capacity, I don't care if it's a pink dial, black, I, whatever it is, I'm buying it. <laughs> Guys, uh, we want to thank you so much for tuning in and listening to us uh, blabber on and on and on about Royal Oaks, but you guys know it's no secret, it's my favorite brand, uh, and it's my favorite model, and Gerald Genta is my favorite watch designer of all time, a legend in my mind and everybody else's, I'm fairly certain, but uh, do what you normally do. Comment below your thoughts, 41 or 39, first and foremost. And your, and your favorite from both, a 39 and a 41, if you had to choose your grail. Choose your grail below, 39 and in the 41 case size. Like, comment, share, subscribe, and we'll see you guys on the next one.